Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Paul Sweet and I am the collection manager of ornithology at the American Museum of Natural History. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm excited for this uh, program. So it's springtime in the Northern Hemisphere and birds are breeding. Uh, today I'm excited to talk about Ben and um, discuss this amazing phenomenon and show you some examples um, from our collection of birds eggs at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ben Walters. Uh, I work with the Bird Cams program at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. Uh, before we give you that behind the scenes look at the egg collection at the museum, uh, we thought we'd walk you through um, some clips from our live streaming bird cams and take you inside the nest of some of the species we feature. Uh, today, we'll be transported inside the nest of some barred owls, some ospreys, and some red-tailed hawks. And it's here where, where we will uh, witness life begin as hatchlings work their way out of the egg and uh, receive their first meals from their parents. So as we go through uh, these highlights, we just want to make sure that you can pop any questions that you have um, into the live chat on YouTube. Uh, we've got people from the museum and um, the bird cams project in there. Um, our, pro our project leader from the bird cams, Charles Eldermeyer, will be answering questions um, as well as museum staff. So um, feel free to ask your questions there and we'll try to answer as many as we can uh, live as well. Excellent. So this highlight you're looking at is our art owl cam. It's located in Indiana. And this was on um, April 11th when the first two chicks hatched in the nest box here. You can see there's one already fluffy white chick that did a barrel roll over there and there was a, another one that had just hatched out. I love this picture here. You can see up in the top left, looks like a couple of uh, white-footed mice and the whole nest is just littered with feathers of uh, what look to be robins. So um, it looks like these bar these barred owls are, are catching it in their, in their nest here. Yeah, they. it is amazing the things that the adults bring into the nest. They're generalist predators, so they'll bring anything from crayfish, earthworms, other birds. We've had baby opossums, um, all sorts of stuff. You never know what you're going to get. And here the female gives us a nice look up um, at the camera. She's the one that spends all of the time incubating the eggs and taking care of the hatchlings until they're old enough to spend time in the box alone. This is amazing. We've got what, two, two red squirrels in there. I see a, a snake. I see blue jayfish. I see a peach. And instead, these are generalists. They'll pretty much eat anything. So you can see these chicks still have pretty closed eyes. They're um, really pretty helpless when they're born. Uh, and later we'll see some other species that are a little bit more advanced when they, when they come out of the eggs. Yeah, but you can see some of the feathers just starting to come through on these chicks. Um, you can see little pin feathers, uh, the little dark protrusions that are starting to grow. And this is where the, the owls will start growing um, their down, or growing out their down feathers and into their uh, juvenile plumages. So here we have so here. Uh, an osprey chick. This is located on above the salt marshes of Skidaway Island near Savannah, Georgia. And I'll let you take it, Paul. Yeah, you can see these these osprey the osprey chicks are much more uh, developed when they come out of the eggs. Ospreys, of course, nest out in the open. They're not in a cavity like a like a barred owl, and their their eyes are open. Um, you can see the, uh, the the egg that this just come out of. It's been really nicely all the way around. These birds have a, a thing called an egg tooth, which is a, which is enables them to just cut around the top of the egg. They move, they sort of move around inside the egg, open up the top, and and are able to just pop out of there. Yep, and you can you can tell that this chick who's just less than one day old hatched is still you know gaining some strength, being able to hold up its head. And these birds eat um, only fish. So you see those little bits of prey that the female was shuttling into the mouth. Those are little bits of ripped up live uh, or fresh fish that the, the adult had just brought to the nest. And here's a nice clip of the second 
Um, chick hatching. Uh, you can see the female maneuvering the freshly hatched egg away from the nest. Oh, here we can see. Just starting to, to peep through, cutting the, cutting the egg um, and able, and it, so it can get out. Um, it's a kind of cool thing to see here. Yeah, and Paul mentioned the egg tooth. So the, that little protrusion on the tip of the bill that these chicks grow allows them to make a little hole in, uh, in the shell of the egg, which is called a pit. So once an egg is pipping, that's when we know that first little hole has been broken through. And typically they'll maneuver themselves in a circular motion around the egg and break through the shell in that way. Just a quick question from Jeremy. How many babies do osprey usually have? Well, it varies, but three is a pretty typical number. Like this, uh, yeah, this clutch we have here. Yeah, and this, uh, we're moving on now to our red-tailed hop cam. And this is a really special scene because hardly ever do we get to see the chick actually, the moment it's actually coming out of the shell. You can still see that yellow goop that's attached to the chick. That is the yolk of the egg. So if you can imagine breaking open a, a chicken egg for breakfast, that's the, the yolk of the egg, which provides a lot of the lipids and some protein for the embryo while it's still in the shell. Um, and the adults were very nice to give us this uh, super clear look at the hatching chick. We have a question uh, from Nisha. Uh, are they being fed by keepers? No, they are not. These are these birds absolutely well. Uh, these cams are, are put up on these nets. Um, and no, they are not captive. Yep, and we have a pretty uh, hysterical scene here where um, like we said, these chicks don't have much strength, so they're sort of uh, wailing about little bobbleheads in the nest, just trying to perk up when it comes feeding time um, during these first couple of days. And one of the chicks seems to have toppled over, but it's still hungry, so it's keeping its mouth open, uh, having a little breakfast in bed there is what we called it. Well, this nest has a ton of squirrels, and by the look of things, I see uh... Go ahead, Ben. Uh, sorry, Paul. So this nest is actually located um, at Cornell University. Uh, these hawks nest in the light towers above campus. Um, so they're, they're a big hit with the campus community. Everybody follows the cam and, and can check in live to see how the hawks are doing every spring. Um, so we wanted to do basically quickly pause here after those highlights before we go into the egg collection of the museum to see if we had any questions from viewers. I have one from Alex K. What are raptors? Well, raptors uh, is a name we give to um, birds of prey, which is a, in itself a difficult term, but typically we, we think of raptors as uh, birds in the um, hawk family, so which includes eagles and kites, um, and then the falcon family, such as peregrines and kestrels, and then we usually include owls in the uh, raptors. So it doesn't really form a natural taxonomic group. It's really uh, birds that tend to catch fairly large vertebrates for their for their prey. It's not a very well-defined term, but that's that's about as close as I'm going to go. Because, of course, lots of other birds are carnivorous uh, predators, even a duck, you know, if it catches a, a fish, it's a predator. But uh, we don't usually consider ducks to be raptors. So. Yeah, and I Hope see a, another comment, question coming in here from Paz um, asking, and, and we saw a lot of prey littered about in the nest there. Do they leave carcasses to rot a bit and make it easier to eat? Or um, does it help them warm the nest? Um, well, we know definitely in the barred owl, in the case of the barred owl and the red-tailed hawks, um, they will definitely leave various prey items strewn about the nest. And this is an indication that there's a really good prey supply um, in their surrounding environment. So we'll often see the the male barred owl who supplies most of the food for that nest in the early stages of the nestling period and over incubation. He will bring in tons of food right before the eggs are about to hatch. They have a, a 
you know, they're right on schedule to build up all this food so the female has plenty to feed um, the chicks. And uh, same goes for the red-tailed hawks. You know, we see chipmunks, squirrels, uh, other birds like pigeons and starlings. Uh, sometimes they bring in snakes. And they'll keep all of uh, this excess prey littered about in the nest um, in order to make sure they have a, a supply for when the chicks become hungry because they feed them multiple times throughout the day. So I've got another question here um, from Julia. How do they eat if they have no teeth? Well, the, the chicks, as you saw with, the, with those red tails and uh, osprey there, the, the adults tear up the prey into small pieces and then feed those little pieces to the, uh, the babies. But adult uh, hawks will often just swallow large things like, you know, with all the feathers and bones, and then they'll disgorge a, what we call a pellet. They'll cough up essentially all the undigestible bits, the bones and the fur and the feathers. Um, and maybe some of you have uh, dissected owl pellets in, in your classes and found mouse bones and mouse fur in them. So um, thanks for that explanation, Paul. That was super helpful. I think now might be a good time to break and uh, have you okay. tell us about what we're, what we're going to see at the museum. Sure. So I'm going to now take you on a, a behind the scenes tour in our egg room uh, at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, the collection of eggs that we have um, comprises of about almost 17,000 uh, egg clutches, uh, which consist, which make up about 55,000 eggs. And we have about 1,800 um, species represented in our collection. So it's a, it's a pretty extensive collection and uh, we'll just let you watch the film now. Hi, I'm Paul Sweet. I'm the collection manager of birds here at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, today I'm in the egg room. Uh, we're going to be looking at some specimens of eggs um, of the species that we will be seeing on the um, nest cams from Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology. So these are historic egg collections. Um, this particular drawer contains the eggs of peregrine falcons. And interestingly, the uh, these eggs of peregrines were key to understanding uh, the problems caused by the pesticide DDT that was used uh, to control mosquitoes. Um, peregrines and other birds such as osprey and pelicans uh, became uh, highly endangered, almost extinct, because they were having poor reproductive success because the DDT was causing their uh, eggshells to thin. So historic collections, amongst many other uh, uses, are critical for our understanding of um, things that are happening with the environment, particularly contamination and pollution. And, um, you know, it's really important that we maintain these collections and keep collecting uh, specimens for these kinds of studies. Unlike the diurnal raptors, like uh, peregrines and red-tailed hawks and uh, osprey, the nocturnal raptors, owls, um, don't have patterned eggs. They have very uh, unmarked eggs, white eggs. Uh, these almost look like, almost look and even feel like ping pong balls. They are um, not quite round, but close to it. And, uh, these barred owls, um, sort of a mid-sized owl, but any owl from a tiny elf owl to a giant uh, great horned owl, um, they all have white eggs. So these beautiful eggs are the eggs of the osprey. Uh, the osprey is a uh, type of raptor. It's in its own family. Uh, it's a very unique raptor that um, exclusively feeds on fish. And again, as I mentioned earlier with the peregrines, these birds are um, were almost wiped out due to eggshell thinning caused by DDT. But fortunately now uh, with the cleanup of the environment and uh, also the clean, cleaner waters, um, 
Ospreys are thriving. Uh, we can see them around New York City, uh, nesting out in Jamaica Bay and other places. Um, and they're just a magnificent bird to, to see out there um, catching fish and bringing their uh, fish to their young on the platforms placed out in the marshes. Really, really a spectacular bird and beautiful eggs. You can see also that they're quite um, varied in, in color and pattern. Some of them are this almost solid sort of reddish brown color. Some of them are rather paler with spots. This one is lovely. Uh, some of them are darker towards one end and paler towards the other. Really remarkable um, variety in these in these specimens here. I love them. So these eggs are the eggs of um, red-tailed hawks. Red-tailed hawks are probably the commonest raptor that we see nowadays in uh, New York City. There are red-tailed hawks nesting around Central Park and uh, you can see them virtually every day you go out. Um, again, they're pretty varied in color. Some are almost pure white and some have various kinds of blotches on them. These are quite beautiful, these ones here. Um, very nice degree of uh, Mottling on some of them. Um, and, you know, red tailed hawk has something that's changed its, in its uh, behavior in recent years, nesting behavior, um, and really adapted to uh, urban areas, along with some other uh, raptors like uh, American kestrel and the peregrine falcon, which we can also find uh, nesting in Manhattan. We don't have any specimens of the northern uh, royal albatross that you'll see on the nest cam. Uh, we do have some specimens here of its very close relative, the wandering albatross, and these eggs would be rather similar to that species. Very large eggs. Um, this species only lays a single egg at a time. Wow, that was uh, so cool to see all the, the size differentiation and uh, all the color variation as well um, in those eggs. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, how, how variable eggs are, you know, when the adults are look pretty much like an osprey. An osprey looks like an osprey, but there's uh, so much variation in, in their eggs. And, uh, you know, some birds like uh, mirrors have incredible variety in their eggs. So I guess we're back to the red tail cam live here is that right yeah so this is our, our red-tailed hawk cam um live right now uh so you can see that the chicks have grown up quite a bit since you saw them in those hatch highlights um so these chicks hatched uh on between april 25th and april 29th so the the chicks don't all hatch at once uh often in raptors you'll see um eggs hatch out asynchronously over a, a number of days. Um, and so these birds are now, oh, I'd say they're they're nearing about 20 days old, three weeks, give or take. Um, and they, they still got another probably two to three, well, actually, you know, about three plus weeks in the nest before they start to take their first flight. Um, so yeah, they they're they're growing up and they're and they're really fun to watch. Uh, they're they're a great little uh, trio to have in front of the camera. Yeah, so fluffy. And um, see, they have a nice supply of chipmunks there at the moment. So <laughs> must be abundant around yeah. campus, I guess. The we don't have any evidence, but we're pretty sure that the the hawks on campus are keeping that chipmunk population under control. <laughs> So we have um, a few questions so, in the 
in the chat here. Do, do we uh, should we uh, take a few of those or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so one question I have here: um, Why are there holes in the eggs? Well, these collections are they're actually just the egg shell. Um, the egg, which is what is inside the shell, um, is removed by drilling a small hole and blowing out uh, the white and the yolk part of the egg. So these were this was these collections are very old. Most of these are egg specimens uh, date back to the 19th century and early 20th century, when uh, egg collecting was was uh, legal and um, uh, uh, quite a widespread hobby. Um, in those days, um, people would go out and collect eggs for their personal collections. And over the years, we inherited these these eggs uh, from these collectors. Um, nowadays, of That's course, awesome. you can't completely. Nowadays, it's uh, illegal to collect any egg or even a broken egg um, without uh, permits. Yeah, the, the collections at the museum are, are really, really amazing. And, you know, once we can all uh, get back to our normal lives and, and visit, it's definitely something to, to, the museum is definitely something to check out for everyone who, who stops, stops by New York City. Um, Absolutely. Looks like we have a, a number of different questions across a, a whole swath of, of different categories here. So I'll, I'll start with one that seems to be pretty popular. Um, a lot of people are asking about the barred owl chicks and how old they are now and when they can start to fly. Um, so right now the chicks are just over a month old and you can see them if you uh, log on to the barred owl cam on our website at uh, allaboutbirds.org slash cams. Um, <clears throat> we'll post that website in the chat as well so you can check it out later. Uh, but the the chicks the bar, when barred owls and many other owls leave the nest they actually aren't fully developed um, at the at this stage right now where they're where they're just old enough to start leaving their cavities or leaving the nest box um, which is you know 33 34 days they're pretty adept at being able to like climb up and down trees and maneuver on branches but their flight isn't very uh, well developed yet so they'll spend another um, between five and seven weeks honing their flight skills and the parents will continue to care for those chicks throughout um, the nestling or throughout the, the fledgling period um, as they continue to supplement them with food and watch over them and provide them care until they eventually disperse from the nest in a, a several months. Yeah. One, one remarkable thing I think about um, some of these like particularly the osprey is that these babies that are just being born now in the fall, they'll they'll leave and they'll fly like they, all the way to South America. I mean, it's just a, an amazing, you know, when they're just a few months old, it's quite a quite an amazing phenomenon. Uh, the barred owls yeah, not so amazing. much. The barred owls be, tend to be more sedentary. But uh. yep, and these are the the two owls that are left in the next box that you see here. Um, one of them left this morning. Uh, it took a short flight from the nesting tree out to a nearby branch and it's gone um, but we still have two in the nest box if you want to spend the last few you know who knows hours or maybe a couple days with the owls we'll still have them live streaming while they're there um, we have another great question about uh, the the variation that we saw um, in the different egg patterns uh, especially the, i'm sure people saw the the variation in the red-tailed hawk eggs and the um, osprey osprey eggs, especially in, in Paul's video at the museum. And they asked, does the variation in egg patterns within a species relate to their environment? Um, is it for camouflage? Um, well, the answer to that is that, yes, it's variation is in the in the pattern or coloration is, is often correlated with uh, species breeding environment. Um, and some species do lay very cryptic looking eggs that can't be easily uh, seen by predators. Um, but there are other reasons for these different patterns as well. Um, like Paul mentioned, the, the barred owls, they lay all white eggs. Um, they're nocturnal uh, species, so they can spend most of the time um, on the nest during incubation. 
but also they're cavity nesters. So if they're nesting in cavities, they're not, their eggs aren't going to be exposed and visible to um, all sorts of dangers um, related to pre predators seeking out food. Um, so that's why they don't need any, uh, another reason why they don't need any different uh, patterns or uh, pigmentation on the eggs. Another interesting um, reason we see different uh, patternation on eggs is because some birds may use it as a defense mechanism against birds that try to parasitize their nests. So some birds are brood parasites, meaning they lay their eggs in other birds' nests. You might know the, uh, you might have heard of the cuckoos or the brown-headed cowbird here in North America. Um, they lay their eggs in other birds' nests and have them raise their chicks as their own. And that's often detrimental to the host species. So um, if they can tell the eggs apart from their, uh, from the birds that are laying eggs in their nest, that's a helpful tool um, for the host species to try to prevent having to take care of that egg. So I've got a question here from Claire. What percentage of eggs survive to be adults? And does hatching order play a role? Well, that's very, highly variable amongst species. Um, some species like in the video, we saw me looking at um, albatross eggs. Well, that species lays just a single egg and it takes a really long time for that bird to fledge. So they invest a lot of time and effort in a single egg. And um, those birds may not breed until they're several years old. Uh, on the other hand, we have birds like chickadees that may, may lay, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten eggs. And um, most of those are actually expected to die. It's not um, feasible that all 10 chickadees are going to survive to breed. Otherwise, the world would be just filled with chickadees. So birds have different breeding strategies. Um, you know, some of them put, put out one egg and some of them put out a lot of eggs. And the ones that put out a lot of, lot of eggs tend to have high mortality. Um, this is why I think birds like albatrosses are very um, susceptible to um, uh, population declines because of things like being, you know, killed by longline fisheries or ocean pollution. So these long-lived, slow-breeding, low-number birds, um, you know, are very susceptible to problems like also the DDT issue, isn't it? Yeah, and, and to piggyback off that, you know, just so much investment put into one egg. If there's something that goes wrong, that means, you know, you're you're done for the breeding season. All of that investment is gone with that one single egg um, versus, you know, uh, like you mentioned, a chickadee that has a, a, a large clutch of eggs. So they can fledge as many as they can, as many as the environment will support. And often that birds um, like that may have a second, uh, second brood. They may not just have one set of eggs over the season. They may have one batch and then another, you know, just to maximize the number of things they get, babies they get out there, just to hope that some will make it through. Yeah, and uh, uh, another part of that question from Clara was, does hatching order play a role? And it definitely does for, for some species, especially uh, birds that um, lay eggs that hatch over, uh, you know, several days. So for example, um, anybody that's watched an osprey cam over a season has probably seen that there's a big, often a big size discrepancy between the older chicks and the younger chicks because the older chicks are, you know, sometimes four or five days older than the youngest chicks being they have more, t more time for development. They've already had, you know, a lot of food to metabolize and grow. Um, and they're also able to monopolize feeding at the nest then. So they have an advantage because of their size and their ability to sort of uh, be dominant in those feeding events, whereby the, the young, smaller chicks, uh, they might, uh, you know, end up starving or dying if there's limited food at the nest because they can't gain access to food because it's prevented by those, those older chicks. Um, you know, it is a... It is a pretty brutal survival strategy in some senses, but um, you know that's what works for them and helps them raise as many healthy ospreys within a nest as they can. Well, sadly, um, the time has flown by, no pun intended, and um, it's time for us to go. So I hope uh, everybody enjoyed looking at these nest cams today. And don't forget, you can 
go online anytime and check them out. And um, I hope once we open up again at the Natural History Museum, you'll be all back to join us there. And thanks very much. Great question. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for spending time with us today. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Um, remember, you can catch up with all the CAMs at allaboutbirds.org slash CAMs, or you can just Google Cornell Bird CAMs and you'll find our site as well. So thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.